Welcome back to part two of the bracket clock restoration. In this episode, I'm stripping down the movement so that I can assess how bad the condition really is. The clock hasn't been worked on for a, a long period of time, far too long in fact. So as you will see as I take the movement apart, there is a lot of built up dirt and debris and old oil causing a lot of problems. This has been causing wear as well, as you'll see later as we take the movement apart. I'm beginning by removing the stripe work from the front plate, the lifting lever, the rack. The gathering pallet was rather tight so I'll come back to showing you how I managed to get that off without levering it and potentially bending the pivot. But once the stripe work is off then I can start dismantling the motion work. First comes the hour wheel bridge and then the cannon or minute wheel from underneath it and the reverse minute wheel on its stub arbor next to it. The dished steel spring that's behind the cannon minute wheel is the clutch mechanism that provides friction to the hands. So this allows you to set the hands by overriding the friction of this spring. Bit of an indication of uh, just how much uh, wear is on this clock was the amount of play on the centre arbour after I'd removed the motion work. And here you can see the extensive wear on the uh, centre arbour and the front of the going fusee. Some clocks, this one included, have a small hole in between two teeth of the great wheel. This allows you to push a piece of pivot steel through the hole and release the ratchet so you can let down the power. Obviously a setup key is needed to let the power down gently in your hand in a controlled way. When using this method of letting down the power on a clock in this kind of condition it's important to be aware that the click may stick inside the great wheel with the old oil and debris so you must be prepared to let down the full power on the setup key. Here I'm taking down the setup on the two springs. I mark the setup ratchets so that I can count the number of teeth of setup it had as received. As you can see this clock didn't have a great deal of setup on those springs. So with the power safely off the clock, we can begin to dismantle the movement properly. First thing that we'll need to do is remove the gathering pallet, which is still stuck to the end of the gathering pallet uh, shaft, squared shaft, which is protruding. In order to do that, the pins have to be removed from the plate. This is a little trick and to use the plate itself to lift the uh, gathering pallet. It's a much safer method than trying to pry things behind the gathering pallet and lever it off because that can bend or break the gathering pallet pivot. A couple of short sharp taps and it's off. Then lifting the front plate to reveal the condition of the trains underneath. I always like to inspect each part as I remove it. it. Gives you an idea of what's going on and the any potential damage you you can spot straight away. Obviously, closer inspection comes later, but you get an idea of the initial condition. So removing the fuses and barrels gives access so the wheels, in this case the centre and third wheel of the going train. And here is the first serious problem to, that we've encountered in the clock. Centre wheel is absolutely solid into the plate. Required tapping through 
from the back side. So a couple of short sharp taps with a punch against the back of the pivot itself and the center wheel just drops out. Now if ever you've thought it was a good idea to run your clock for 15-20 years just because it carries on going, this is a good indication as to why not to do that. Oil has completely gone, been replaced with dirt, and has been wearing in that pivot hole to the point where it's virtually seized. Another maybe 6 to 12 months of running on this clock and I could see that pivot having seized solid into the plate and snapped off. Here you can see dirt that has come out of that pivot hole and sat on the centre pillar of the movement. You can see the amount of dirt that is built up inside the pivot holes. This clock is particularly extreme actually, the amount of uh, wear that's on it. It's been left far too long. The fusy pivots look bad, but at least they've got some oil around them still, which has stopped them from wearing too seriously. The thing that I don't like about this is this line. I really dislike any kind of metal braided line because it, it wears the grooves of the fusy and it wears a groove. Can you see the groove that's been worn onto the, uh, onto the barrel? You can see the pattern of that line that's been transferred to the surface of the brass, which is not a nice thing. It should have gut lines, either synthetic or natural, which is what it'll have when it goes back together again. And here's the condition of the lower end of the train, really badly worn been some previous bushing and repair work done to these plates in a not so nice fashion. Punching up the bottom of a bush like that is not good practice. And riveting a lump of brass to the front of the bearing is even worse practice. The only possible reason I can think for doing something like that is that they've tried to do it without dismantling the clock, which is uh, not a good practice at all. Now on the bottom end of the train, on the uh, bar mainspring barrels, these are often neglected on clocks like this because the barrel itself doesn't have teeth. So wear in the pivot hole is not actually causing any problems with engagement, meshing of the train. However, if you don't address the condition of the of the bushes on the barrels, the barrel actually loses energy here by tipping over to the side and causing more friction. So it's important to give yourself all the power that is available to you by having the barrel bearings in good condition. Fusey great wheel had been rubbing on the uh, center wheel. You can see here that they were too close together and it creates this pattern as the center wheel passes through engagement. It drags on the back of the fusey. Here's the ratchet and click mechanism. We were pushing on that steel click with the piece of pivot steel in order to let the the power off the clock. It was a good moment to pop the barrel caps off and have a look at what's going on underneath. In this case the springs are really dirty. They've been greased or at least used a very heavy oil that has completely deteriorated and dried up so now we've got this sort of dry brown gunk that's causing the springs to all the leaves to bind together. It's the same story on the strike side. So these springs need to come out. I've used various different mainspring winders over the years but for certainly for bigger springs I really like this uh, American style mainspring winder. It's 
works essentially like a, uh, a sort of a watch mainspring winder, but it, what's great about it is you can actually capture the spring in these steel hoops, which makes it a really safe, controlled way of removing a big spring. You're not left at any point with a spring in your hand having to resist the, uh, the power with a pair of pliers on the tail of the spring or anything nasty like that. It's a really controlled way of doing things. You wind the spring up using the, the tool and slide in the steel holder, which will hold the spring in its wound, or at least its barrel size. Then you can wind the spring down inside the, the hoop and remove the barrel. Before rehooking the spring in the tool, winding it back up again, and then removing the steel hoop, and then you can wind the spring down. This is probably the riskiest moment, but even though the spring is in your hand, it's not actually, you're not having to hold the power, you're just sort of stopping it from sliding side to side. That's almost certainly the date that this clock was last worked on. If you'd like to support me and this channel, I've got a Patreon page and any support that you can give is really appreciated. You can also follow along by following me on Instagram at tommy.jobson. So look out for part three of this series where I'll be working on the barrels. I'll see you on part three.